Okay, B before I start, let me just say a big thank you to Florent and Lenka. You know, the summer school, from my point of view, has been pretty amazing. And so, so I really appreciate your putting it together. I've learned a lot, so, so it's great. Um, okay, so, so my plan is I, I want to tell you about some ideas that I've been really excited about the last couple of years. And they have to do with understanding both the phenomena and kind of the techniques for studying neural networks at finite width. So, so my plan for the first lecture is I'm going to kind of take the geodesic route to telling you exactly the mathematical problem I want to study. And, and then I'm going to back away and give you a bit of motivation for why. Uh, I'll try to give you a little uh, explanation of what the high-level answer is supposed to be, why study things at finite width, and what's new about finite width networks, and a bit of intuition for how the answer comes about. And then I'm going to actually try to prove a theorem. OK, so may, hopefully you'll excuse me. Not everything will be exactly proved, but I, I really want to explain the techniques so that you can use them. I think these are things people in the summer school might actually find to be exciting. OK, so, so please stop me if you have questions or comments or anything like that. So let me just start with the notation. It'll be very similar to Yasuman's notation, but OK, ever so slightly different. Everyone seems to have their own nomenclature. OK, so the inputs to my network I'm going to call x sub alpha. And my input dimension is n0. So these are not the components of x alpha, just these alphas index the possible network inputs. OK, and the output of the network, I'm going to have l hidden layers and then a linear readout. I'm going to write ZL plus 1 alpha. So this is going to be an R and L plus 1. OK, and at the risk of boring you to death, let me tell you exactly my notation for the weights and biases as well. OK, so, so this is the vector of preactivations at layer L plus 1. This is the ith neuron, and it corresponds to input X alpha. OK, so the debauch of indices has begun. Right, and there's basically two cases for it. One case which comes in the first layer, and that's just because we don't apply a nonlinearity there. Right? So we sum j goes from 1 up to n0. We have the weights in layer 1, and then we have i, j, and we have x, j, alpha. So this is when l is equal to 0. And otherwise, we just uh, insert a nonlinearity. So my nonlinearity is going to be sigma rather than phi. OK, I hope you'll forgive me for that as well. So this is nl. WL plus 1 IJ sigma of ZLJ alpha. Is it L greater equal to 1? OK, and, and just to, for completeness, my hidden layer widths are little n's. So, so in this case, since I'm in the L plus first layer, I goes from 1 up to NL plus 1. OK, that's, that's the kind of networks that I have. And now I can tell you the goal or the problem I'd like to study. So the goal goes like this. Uh, I'm going to be interested in the distribution of the preactivations in my network when the weights and biases are going to be random. Okay, so, so let me explain that. So I'd like to compute the distribution of all of these ZL alpha. So maybe I'll just write the output. Okay, I think of this uh, as given an input, I get an output. So this gives me a random field or a stochastic process, whatever language you like to use. OK, so this thing and its derivatives okay, with respect to parameters and inputs and everything else. Okay, and, and the situation I want to be in is when these hidden layer widths, n sub l, are large but not infinitely large. OK, so n sub 1 up to n sub capital L, I want them to be proportional to a large integer n. So, so that's my notation. In other words, I'm going to think of the input dimension as generally fixed. The output dimension is fixed, and all the hidden layer widths are going to be large. OK, so and I haven't told you yet about my distribution on the weights and biases. And at least for this first lecture, I want to think of the biases as being a Gaussian with mean 0 and variance CB. And I want to think of the weights WLIJ as Gaussian with mean 0 variance CW over NL minus 1. OK, so, so, so that's my setting. OK, just to be clear, with all parameters being independent. OK, so, th so this is typically how we initialize our networks. Yes, yeah, so, so, so at the moment, I'm going to think about it like this. I want to understand the distribution of these Z's first conditional on the data. And then certainly a thing I would like to do is then I would like to integrate out the data dependence. 
And that's possible to some extent, and in some situations, I don't know how to do it. So for now, I just want to think of the like, uh, y given x distribution, if you want, like the prediction given the data. And I'm not integrating out the data. My, my data points are arbitrary and, and kind of fixed. OK, so, 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 so this is the problem I'd like to study. Um, you know, this is like some theory. It's got some distributions. All the parameters are random. And, and I want to know what happens. OK, so before I try to tell you what I think is the high level answer and how one actually computes it, I want to give you a couple of pieces of motivation for why in the world one would study such a thing. I think some of them are obvious. Maybe some of them are a little less obvious. OK, so, so the, the first motivation, which I'm too embarrassed to even write, so I'm just going to say in words, OK, it's kind of philosophical, right? Like, if you have a very complex object, maybe the large scale properties of this object are determined, or at least like kind of similar to what happens when the object is chosen at random. OK, this works in random matrix theory. Sometimes it helps in neural networks, sometimes it doesn't, but it's not totally crazy. OK, so, so but in a more realistic way, so motivation number one is I'd like to understand the prior or you know, the initial distribution that you get when you start training on functions. Right? It's very clear what the prior is on the weights and the biases. I just told you they're independent Gaussians. But just like in Heim Sempolinsky's lectures and you know, like Practically any time you want to analyze gradient descent or any kind of optimization algorithm, we'd like to know what kind of initial guesses are we starting with for optimization. OK, so, so the second and somewhat related motivation is um, you know, when, when you use neural networks, there's many, many choices you have to make. You have to choose the architecture. You have to choose sigma. But there's also all these hyperparameters, the variance of the weights and the biases. You have to choose learning rates. You have to choose regularization strength. There's all these things that are painful. And so, so you might ask, how do you choose them at least so that at initialization they scale appropriately? Okay, so, so setting hyperparameters like the weights and bias variances, the step sizes, the regularization strengths for various things. Um, so, so Yasuman talked a little bit about the CB and CW settings. This was about making sure that signals can propagate forward and backward in your network. There's been some recent very cool work about setting the learning rates. OK, that's in the mean field initialization. But actually, everything I say can be reused for that as well. It's just the answers are somewhat different. And, and I think in practice, people really care about having prescriptions for setting these kind of parameters. OK, so, so, so motivation number three is I'd like to understand deviations from the NTK regime. OK, so I'll say much more about this in a moment. But, but basically, you know, you saw plenty of times now that if you just fix capital L and you let the n's go to infinity, at least in this initialization, at least if your learning rate is small, you converge to a linear model. And OK, that's nice for saying many concrete things about optimization, but it can be difficult because it obscures the nature of feature learning and things like that. And so, so if you're going to study feature learning in this initialization, you have to do it at finite width. OK, so, so, so that's made motivation number four. Okay, and then I can't help myself because I'm a mathematician at heart. You know, I have a fourth motivation, which is that you know, these neural networks, from my point of view, are kind of very beautiful generalizations of random matrix products. OK, so, so these are like nonlinear generalizations. And I'll say some more about this in a moment, of products of L random matrices okay, of size n times n. So I'll say more about this, but this is a very well studied thing. If you basically just turn off the biases and you make the nonlinearity the identity, you get a product of random matrices. This comes up, and so this is an interesting generalization to study, and indeed there are new effects here. Okay, so, so, so one of the things I'm going to try to tell you now is that somehow hiding in the background of studying finite width networks is that, at least in the NTK parameterization or initialization, I claim you cannot understand the role of the network depth without actually studying things at finite width. That's going to be one of the big points I try to make. And so, 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 so I want to kind of make that point now, at least heuristically, and then we'll prove some rigorous results that actually make it happen. So, 
So, so, so, so yes. Okay. So let me put it this way. Um, I think there are there are there are many different ways to try to study these large networks, and in particular, I think everyone agrees that in some sense you want to study feature learning. So, so like, how how could we get to a regime with feature learning? Well, there's like at least three ways, right? You can take the step size to be large. That's one option. You can take the mean field scaling. And then even at infinite width, you're going to have feature learning. But I'm going to propose a third thing, which is that even with this exact scaling, with small step sizes and everything, as long as you're at finite width, taking L to be large is going to cause feature learning to happen too. Yeah, and, and the truth is that I think it's really fascinating to understand the exact relationship between them and, and how they fit together. And I, I don't know which of them or what combination of them real neural networks are kind of effectively doing or if it's something else. I think that's really interesting. And, and yeah, I, I wish I could say something more concrete. Yeah, other questions or comments? OK, so, 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 so let me tell you the answer to the question. OK, like, let me not keep you too much in suspense. So, so what can we say about these networks at finite width? Well, one of the things that I find to be very exciting is that you know, when, when I started doing neural network theory, people always said, well, or not always, but often said, neural networks are so complicated, you can't understand them, at least not really. Again, I think all of you are counterexamples to this fact. But one of the things that I think is cool in this setting is that I actually claim that you can understand absolutely everything about the distribution of a random neural network in this initialization, okay, even at finite width to any order in 1 over n. Okay, so, so I'm going to try to make that precise. But, but it's like they're exactly solvable models, or at least close to that. Okay, so here's the answer. So when n is large, okay, this is going to be slightly heuristic, and then I'll make it precise, the distribution of your random neural network is determined by the following. OK, so, so, so it's actually not primarily determined by L or N separately, but it's actually determined by what you can think of as an effective temperature, inverse temperature, really, or an effective depth. OK, so you take the sum of the reciprocals of the Ns, which I will typically just refer to as L over N. OK, so this is like my effective depth in a way I'll try to explain. So that's, that's one piece of information. It's not depth or width separately, but it's really the ratio of the two of them that play a key role. OK, and what I'll call the universality class of the nonlinearity sigma. OK, so, so, so from my point of view, again, kind of as a mathematician to some extent, sigma was the identity for these random matrix products. And you all probably know about universality and random matrix theory. It's about changing the distribution of the weights and biases. But here, there's a new notion of universality that appears. And it's about the kind of nonlinearity you have. It turns out that ReLU is very different than hyperbolic tangent, for example. OK, I'll, I'll, I'll get into that a little bit. OK, so, 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 so that's really my answer. And the kind of picture that I want to make is the following. So I'm going to try to prove various versions of this picture. Oh, good. Okay, that will dry, I hope, in a second. So, so um, I don't know how good it's going to be to write on this. That's a disaster. All right. So, 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 so let me, okay, I, I want to make a nice big picture. So I'm going to give it a second. So, so here I'll tell you what L over N controls. And then I'll draw the picture. Okay, so, so this effective depth, I claim, I'm going to try to explain. I'll really try to prove a theorem about this. It tells you about many things about your network. So for instance, it tells you about the correlations between neurons. So neur I'll call it neuron-neuron correlations. So I'll, I'll remind you of this. But if you remember from Yasaman's lectures, what happens in the infinite width limit, if you fix L and you let n go to infinity, is that all neurons are actually independent of each other. There's no neuron-neuron correlations. And that's very sad in its own way. right? I thought neural networks were supposed to somehow talk to each other. But as we'll see, the correlations between neurons uh, are controlled by L over N. Oh, thank you, Lake. <laughs> yeah, of course. So it does, but I'm fixing those. I, I don't think of them as particularly large. So, so, so yes, and you'll see, but, but not too much. Yeah. 
Um, so, so, so it's fair, but, but I, yeah, it, I'll try to explain that this is the main parameter, but, but you'll see. Okay, so this is one thing that one might care to study. The other is fluctuations, fluctuations in the output and its derivatives. So if you care about the derivatives with respect to parameters, the input-output Jacobian, the fluctuations are all controlled by L over N. Okay, and then maybe the last thing I'll say is the distance to the NTK regime. Okay, so, so, so let me just try to illustrate this in kind of a, a picture, which is my favorite picture. Okay, here it is. So, so, so I, I think of L as being on the x-axis, and N, or my measure of width, as being on the y-axis. And I basically think like this. I think that there are two, as I'll explain, very different ways of trying to understand these random neural networks. The first is you fix L, and you let N go to infinity. This is what we typically call the NTK regime, okay, or the GP limit, or whatever you want. Okay, and, and, and essentially, in this limit, at least with my initialization, neural networks become linear models. Okay, very good. So this is like having depth zero. So you see, this is like L over N equals zero. And my explanation for why you get linear models is that although L was fixed, that's not the right measure of depth. Really, it's L over N is the right measure of depth. I'll try to explain that. Okay, and that, and that between these two regimes, at large N and at large L, so over here, things are untrainable. Right, this is why, or one of the reasons people invented skip connections and batch normalization and things. If you just take a vanilla neural network at a fixed width and you let L be too large, you just can't train the thing. So, so you run into exploding and vanishing gradients, like just numerical stability issues. Just the L, because this effective depth shouldn't be so like L tilde, or is it really the same L as in the beginning, or am I? So, 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 so what I'm saying is like, sorry, so, so, so maybe to answer your question, the way I think about this diagram is you should really think about L over N being constant as being things that measure, you know, L over N is a constant, which I'll call C. And then here, my effective depth is zero, and here it's infinite. And so, 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 so my claim is going to be like this, that if you take one of these large networks and you double both L and N, you practically have the same kind of network, at least from the point of view of what kind of correlation functions you compute. And so, so, so it's in that sense that, that really, like, everything is controlled by this one parameter. So it's really the, that same L that I have. And, you know, I, I'm just too lazy to write the sum of the reciprocals. That's kind of what I mean. Yeah, yeah, sir. Nothing will change. I'm just saying anything I do could be done like this. They're all proportional for me. That's the only important issue. Okay, so, 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 so somehow the, the point that I want to make is like this. So, so here, psi equals zero. This is the regime where you're much wider than you are deep. Here, psi equals infinity. And, and as I go from zero to infinity, what happens is I get more feature learning. So that sounds good. I'm farther and farther from the NTK regime. But also, I get more instability. Okay, and I'll, I'll actually do that. Well, either in this lecture or in the next lecture, I'll tell you about, I think about that statement. And so, 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 so one of the things you see is that you cannot really understand the role of depth at infinite width, because it's really their ratio that matters. And somehow, you know, you want L over N to be positive from this point of view, but not too large. That's the kind of picture I want to advocate. Okay, so, 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 so that's my like very high level explanation of the kind of thing I want to prove some like concrete results about. Uh, and, and I want to give you some techniques for really seeing this L over N come out in, in kind of a variety of ways. Okay, so, so let me just pause and ask if there are questions. Yeah, Nachi? Yeah, so, 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 okay, so I swept something under the rug. You're totally right. So, so, so the way I'm effectively doing this is the following. You give me a nonlinearity sigma, and that sigma is going to determine for me how to choose CB and CW. So if sigma is ReLU, for example, and I'll do this calculation if I have time, you want to take CB equals 0 and CW equals 2. And that's kind of the unique setting that, that gives you a, a well-behaved large L limit. And then once you set those, then you can try to talk about what happens at large L. So, so, so this picture is really when you've chosen CB and CW correctly. 
Yeah. So, so I'm, I, yeah, I won't be emphasizing that, but, but that's a good point. Yeah, please. Yeah, so, 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 so I think that's, okay, that's a very interesting question. You're asking, suppose I had one bottleneck layer and everything else is very wide. Can I do, can I understand what happens? The short answer is you could certainly use the techniques I'm going to present to explain what happens, but I don't know the answer. So, so I do suspect that something interesting will happen. You'll get some sort of feature learning, but, but like I can't tell you much about it. Okay, so, so um, yeah, right now, like th this is what I know how to do most explicitly, yeah. So, so essentially, the way you should think of it is, as soon as n is large, then, 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 then you just have a, a leading order effect, which is going to be constant when you're close to n being large. And then you'll have corrections, which go to 0 as n goes to infinity, relative to these leading order effects. So, 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 so I'm making a somewhat surprising claim. When n is large with one of these fully connected networks, with this initialization and so on, if you double l and n, you get the same thing, or almost the same thing. It's not completely obvious that that should be true. Nope. I'll, so I'll, I'll prove that for you. In fact, I'll prove that in the next lecture. I'll show you for ReLU networks how to get exact control of the exploding and vanishing gradient problem. But the answer to your question is that the fluctuations in the gradients will be proportional to, five, to, to the exponential of 5 times L over n. That's going to be the answer. So if L over n is constant, you're fine. It's just L needs to be smaller than n to control the variance of the gradients. Yeah. All, As we start training, this can get so, so, so correct, absolutely true. So, so everything I'm saying formally is at initialization. But, but okay, let me advertise one thing. Okay, I recently wrote a book with two physicists, Dan Roberts and Sho Yaida, and they're really great. And in this book, in the second half, they, it's really all their contribution for the second half. They, they did this like really cool calculation where maybe I should have added this to the motivation. Just like you can do perturbation theory around the NTK limit for initialization, they were actually able to do perturbation theory around this NTK limit for the end of training. It's very much like what Yasuman was telling us yesterday, doing these kind of systematic 1 over n corrections to the NTK regime. And the difference between what was done before and what they did is that they get the full L over n dependence. So, so, so the kind of thing that they can do, okay, so this is, I'll attribute it to them, it, it is the following. So if I were to be very precise, they take this setting, they take a small initial learning rate, small but positive, and what they can tell you is like this. They can tell you that ZL plus 1 alpha trained, so, so if you train the network by gradient descent on mean squared error, what you get is, okay, you get at leading order the thing you thought about, so you get the NTK answer, plus you get L over N times a new thing, alpha nu, okay, plus corrections of order L over n quantity squared. So, so they think of L over n as itself being perturbative and they keep only the 1 over n corrections. And, and, and what they can do is they can give you a complicated but explicit recursion for this with respect to L. So, so, so solving this recursion is truly a nightmare and in particular extracting the data dependence is like not something we know how to do. But, 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 but what you do learn is that the strength of the corrections scales like L over N. That's a kind of clear thing you learn. And moreover, you see in the definition of this recursion how the details of your optimizer come in. Now it matters, do you do GD or SGD? Do you do this or that? Whereas here, you know, when it was convex, you couldn't see the differences. So, so, so it's like, it's a little bit like the mean field limit. You can write these beautiful equations and it's hard to integrate out the data or tell me like in a concrete way what kind of feature learning maybe occurred. So, 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 so you, you can do this too, and that's kind of like, you know, in this regime up here, you might say, where L over N is positive but small. And here by training, it's training to zero test error? Or like yeah, this, you just let T go to infinity. That's right. So you fix the data set. The data set, like in the NTK regime, is a fixed size. It's not scaling with the model width. And you train your, your network on mean squared error, and then you make predictions on any input you want. 
Okay, so, so if people are interested, you can tell me, and I'll, I'll give you the references for that. So let me erase this. Very good. Oh, God. Okay, nice. All right, so, so, so okay. And now I want to slowly move towards doing something concrete rather than just kind of speaking vaguely. I just wanted to give you the lay of the land. And the first thing I want to do is I want to give you an intuition for why L over N. Like, how could you have guessed that? Why does that appear as opposed to something else? So, so okay, why L over N? Uh, so, so, so I want to explain this by actually turning off sigma. You can already see it in the deep linear case. So I'm going to take CB equals 0, CW equals 1, sigma of T to be T. And in fact, I'll take the norm of my input to be of size 1 as well. It doesn't much matter. OK, and in this setting, what do you get? You get ZL alpha is just the product. I'll rescale L to L minus 1, basically. So I don't have to write L plus 1 all the time. OK, it's what I was saying. The output of your network is just a product of random matrices applied to the input. I should also say, I'll just take all the and else to be L. I'll call that the Lanka scaling. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. Ju just for simplicity. Great. So, so, you know, let me redraw the picture I had over there because I want to actually do a concrete calculation here, but also make a couple of remarks. So here's L, and here's N. Okay. So, so the first thing I want to convey is that L and N you should think of as fighting each other. Okay. They don't like each other. They're not very good friends. They pull in opposite directions, and and you can think of this like this. L is like a time parameter. Okay, you think like a dynamical systems person, and time one evolution is multiplied by a random matrix, or maybe apply one random layer. So it's like you're, you're watching something evolve longer, longer in time. And N is like a system size, number of degrees of freedom. And you know, from this point of view, bigger systems take longer to come to equilibrium. And so, so they're going to fight each other. L and N don't like each other very much. OK, and, and these matrix products have been studied kind of in two famous regimes. One is the free probability regime, okay, where you fix the depth and you let the width go to infinity. It's kind of the analog of the NTK regime. And you should think of this as having max entropy. OK, here, if you're just sophisticated enough, everything about these matrix products is all about maximizing the appropriate non-commutative entropy. OK, it's a beautiful subject. Very good. But there's an equally beautiful subject over here. Okay, so, so this is, if you want, the min entropy regime. And it's the domain of what's sometimes called the multiplicative ergodic theorem. Okay, so if you've never heard of it, you secretly have heard of it. Okay, when people study things like Anderson localization, if you think of transfer operators, that's really what these matrix products are all about. And here, you know, you, you actually converge to like an almost sure limit at each fixed n. You take a product of more and more random matrices, and there's no universality, there's no maximum entropy. They're very, very different regimes. Okay, so, so, so what I want to do is I now want to explain how L over n appears by considering potentially the simplest possible observable. Okay, I just want to consider the squared norm of the network output, or just of this product of random matrices. Okay, so I fix a unit vector x alpha, and I just want to know how much does this product distort its norm. And you'll see the L over N coming out already, and you'll see that L and N fight each other. OK, so, so that's, my, um, that's my goal. All right, so, so, so it's time for a pop quiz for the PhD students. OK, you ready? So, so um, very good. Let's start with the free probability regime. So if you fix L, and you let n go to infinity, what does this random variable converge to? <laughs> Not a pop quiz. Gosha. What? Gosha. No? Well, well, well it, it does converge to a Gaussian, but that's not, well, you know, you'll see. Kid? What? What else? Well, well you, you see, the, the key thing to remember is that when you have a product, when you have an n by n Gaussian matrix that's with the appropriately normalized variances, it's approximately an isometry. It takes any vector and takes it to something whose norm is very, very close to that of the original vector. And since the number of terms was fixed, this whole matrix is going to take my initial vector x to something that's very, very close to its norm. And in particular, what you get 
is that it converges to just the norm of x almost surely. So it is a Gaussian just with variance zero. OK, so technically you were right. What can I say? OK. Um, all right, fine. So, so, so that, that's the large end scaling of this thing. OK, we'll come back to this when I try to prove a theorem. This is really all about some self-averaging things, so you get some, some law of large numbers. Very good. OK, how about this way? Oh, God. OK, so, so here I fix the size of the matrix, and the L get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. What happens? All right, anyone know the answer to this one? Zero. zero. OK, very good. How do you know it's zero? So, so, okay, so, so, so great. So, so Yatin is saying, you know, if you want to take the large L limit, the right thing to do is to raise this matrix product to the 1 over L power. That's what causes the spectral norm to remain kind of reasonable. And it, 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 this, the largest singular value is a little bit less than 1 in this scaling. So, if so you don't raise to the 1 over L power, it gets smaller and smaller and smaller, and this converges to 0 almost surely. Okay, so, so, so this is a disaster from the point of view of trying to understand large L, right? Even in linear networks, if you first go to infinite width and then go to infinite depth, you just won't see what's going on, even for just like the prior on a single input. It's just not going to help you. Okay, so, so, so all right. I was once told that a good talk has the following ingredients, okay? It needs to have a theorem, a picture, a calculation, and a joke, okay? And the key point is that the joke and the theorem have to be different. All right, so, 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 let, so it's time for a calculation. I have to knock that out. OK, so, so let's figure out what happens in between. OK, this is like the simplest calculation that there is. And this, from my point of view, at least about random networks. So I claim we'll actually be able to get the full distribution of this object. It's kind of an unusual situation. And we'll get it without having to work very hard. OK, the mantra is just don't freak out and use symmetry. All right, so, so OK, I just used the definition. Very good. So, so here's the basic idea. What we do is we just multiply and divide by the norm of W1x alpha. Okay, and then we stare at the result. Remember, W is a Gaussian random matrix. So what do we know? Well, OK, first of all, this is a correct equality. OK, that wasn't too bad. But so, 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 so what do we have? Well, this thing has a distribution that we know. Right? This is a chi-squared random variable with n degrees of freedom with 1 over n in front because that was the variance, and then to the 1 half power because they took the square root of the sum of the squares. Right? Very good. And because this matrix was Gaussian, you know, the norm of this Gaussian vector w1 alpha is independent of the unit vector you get, the direction. Right? That's the symmetry of the Gaussian. And so, so, so this thing is simply uniform on the sphere, Sn minus 1. And you see that, therefore, uh, this term is actually completely independent of this remaining product. And you can just keep going in this way, right? This matrix is rotationally invariant, so it didn't matter which unit vector I had here. And so what you get is that in distribution, this random variable here, when you just apply this L times, has the same distribution, product on L goes from 1 up to capital L, of I'll write it this way, WL E1. I chose my favorite unit factor. OK, so, 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 so this is an exact statement. There's no expectations or correlations being taken. You know, Every moment of the left-hand side is equal to the corresponding moment of the right-hand side. And what you see is that although the you know, input kind of flows through the network, what happens is the contribution from each layer is just independent. Each layer kind of distorts the vector a little bit. OK, and now you see L and N fighting each other. So, so let, let me write this out in a kind of more explicit way. So this is the exp of the sum of the logs. OK, that's a strong trick. Right, and now you can just apply the central limit theorem to understand this, right? This is a sum of L independent random variables. And each one of these things is close to 1. That's what I was saying. And it turns out that each one of these logarithms has mean minus 1 over 4n. And it has variance 1 over 4n when you do the calculation. OK, so, so altogether, you get that when L is large, this converges to the exponential of a Gaussian with mean minus L over 4n. 
and variance L over 4n. They were independent, so you just add the means and the variances. OK, and so, so, so from my point of view, you get this kind of like beautiful interpolation. You see that the answer here depends only on L over n. And, and the way that L over n appeared is that each layer contributed a deviation of size 1 over n. So that, that's how you think of the sum of the reciprocals. Each layer is like 1 over n away from the infinite width limit. But when you have L of them, you could be pretty far from the infinite width limit. OK, so, 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 so over here, right, I got e to a Gaussian with mean minus 1 quarter xi and variance 1 quarter xi. OK, and now we can check our answers, right? Over here, xi was equal to 0. And over here, xi was equal to infinity. Xi is my L over n. So here you get e to a Gaussian with mean 0, variance 0. OK, success. You get 1 almost surely. You didn't make a huge mistake. Right? And down here, you get a Gaussian with mean minus infinity okay, and standard deviation square root of infinity. So you get e to the minus infinity, which is 0 almost surely. OK, so, so, so this is supposed to be, for me, the, the simplest explanation of, of how to see L over n is interpolating between the two regimes and why you can't understand large L without going to finite n. OK, so, so, so that's my attempt at a calculation. So let me stop, and I'll take comments or questions before trying to say something that's more precise about the nonlinear networks, at least. Yeah. Is there a reason why you draw the, you stop the square at that point? Yeah, so, so, so it's like, um, you know, if you, if you had a, so, so you could draw the square like this. So this is kind of what algebraic geometers like to do, or I, I'm sure people in physics do it too. I just don't know the words. And I have L and N. But this point is ambiguous because how I approach this point matters. That's what I'm saying. Like what the value, what, at what slope you approach that point. And so the typical thing you do is you take this point out and you replace it by its normal bundle. You basically replace it by something that can remember the direction at which you approached it, which in this case is just a sphere. OK, so, so it's what algebraic geometers call blow up. But, but I mean, I think it's just a fancy word for how to keep track of a phase diagram where on the boundary, everything is a continuous function of your parameters. You would have discontinuous answers at this point before. But when I introduce this new parameter, now it helps to interpolate between the two regimes. Yeah, because the log is concave, and the way you set it up is the expectation of the square of this thing inside is exactly 1. So the expectation of 1 half the log has to be strictly less than the log of 1, which is 0. So, so you know it's going to be slightly negative. So it's a log of a normal distribution? Well, it's a, it's a log of a chi-squared distribution, right? But, but the, and the chi-squared has mean 1. And so, 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 so when you take the log, the mean shifts a little bit to the left, and you get log of something slightly less than 1. Yeah. Uh, so in this case, uh, we can't divide at n, right? Because we are assuming n is very large. So we can't have like small values of l keeping the proportions n over n. Y yeah, OK. So, so you're right. So up to here, this is an exact statement. OK, the distribution is just a product of l independent random variables with the same distribution. But then surely to apply the central limit theorem, I need l large. And so, so, so but, but my point was to, to try to understand the joint dependence on L and N. That's why I wrote the last line. But you're right. Up to here, you just get what you get. And then, yeah. OK, very good. So, so OK, so, so that's my best attempt to explain how the L over N comes out. And I'm going to try to prove a theorem which essentially says that it's always the same, even if you have a nonlinearity. Each, in each layer, you're going to have some order parameter that's self-averaging. And it's going to try to push you towards the Gaussian process limit. But you're going to have a 1 over n correction from each layer. And when you add them up, you're going to get an L over n correction. That's how it's going to work. Okay. All right. All right, very nice. So OK, more questions. I, I want to now start actually going towards the theorem. So I need to be, get a little bit more technical, Okay, or at least more precise. All right, so, 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 so let's remember. Good. What Yasaman told us. So let's recall. So, so, so what did we have in this Gaussian process limit, which is kind of in this free probability regime in that picture? Right? So, so the, the result was that if uh, we fix right, the number of layers, the input dimension, the output dimension, and sigma, 
Okay, so then what did we have? We had that our entire distribution of the output of the network at initialization converges to a GP. Okay, so as n1 and n l go to infinity, you get a Gaussian process with mean zero and a covariance function which he has someone called KL plus one, which I call by the same letter. So, so what does this mean more precisely? Right? This means that because it's Gaussian, I only need to tell you the one and two point functions, right? the mean and the covariance. And so the expectation of ZL plus one I alpha goes to zero. Okay, in fact, it's zero for every finite width just by symmetry of the weights. But more interestingly, the covariance between the output, you know, the ith component of the output at input alpha and the ith component, or let's say the jth component of the output at input x beta, right? So this thing converges to delta ij. So this was the statement that the components of the output are independent times this function kl plus 1 evaluated at my two inputs, alpha and beta. Okay, that, that was the statement that we had before. Um, okay, very good. So, so, so that's, that's this regime up here. And now my goal is to try to explain what is the distribution of this uh, stochastic process of this random field without taking n1 up to nl to infinity. So, so I have to tell you how one does that. All right, so, so, so here's the key point. So n b, and I will explain how to deal with this now, right? But so when the widths are finite, when the parameter n is not allowed to go to infinity, right? So z l plus one i alpha, these outputs, they're not Gaussian. And they're not independent. So life is tough. But you know that's what they pay us the big bucks for, right? To take tough problems and try to solve them. Or maybe they don't pay us the big bucks, and I mixed that up. OK, so we do it for some other reason, presumably. OK, so, so, so the question is like this. You have some stochastic process, or you have a random field, which is almost a free theory, okay, almost a Gaussian process. The question is, how do you study it when it's close but not exactly? OK, and there's, there's sort of a canonical way of doing that, which I'll remind you of now. So, so in fact, maybe before I do that, let me just ask, oh my god, disaster. So, so how many people know what connected correlation functions are? Okay, how many people know what cumulants are? Okay, so you know that they're the same thing in particular, at least in the intersection of those two. All right, very good. So, so, so wonderful. Okay, so how do you study something that's approximately Gaussian but not exactly? Okay, so, so maybe I'll write it here just to, for economy of space. So I'm going to study via cumulants. Okay, and I'll remind you the exact definition now because we'll need it in the proof of what I'm about to do. Right, so, so how do you study, so, so let me just fixate on the simplest case. Uh, the cumulants, I'm going to fix an input x alpha, I'm going to fix an output neuron i, and I'm just going to study the distribution of this thing. So I don't have too many indices, though you can do it for anything you'd like. Right, so, so, so here's the definition. So you compute the characteristic function right, x minus i, so c is like a parameter or a dual variable, times z l i alpha. Very good, right? And what you do is you write this in kind of Hamiltonian form. So you write this as the exponential of the sum on k greater or equal to 0. And you have these objects, kappa k of z l i alpha over k factorial times minus i c to the k. OK, so, so the point is that the left-hand side is the implicit way to define what are called the cumulants. So kappa k is the kth cumulant or the kth connected correlation function of your random variable z l i. OK, that's, that's the definition. You can just view left and right-hand side as just formal power series in this parameter xi. You don't have to think too hard about convergence if you don't want. OK, so, so I don't know if this is the form in which people normally introduce cumulants, but let me just say, what's the point? So, suppose that I wanted to understand the distribution of ZLI alpha, right? What, what's going to be my game? Well, one thing you could do is you could understand the moments of this distribution. That's a totally good way to characterize it, at least usually. But you can also characterize it completely using the cumulants. And the cumulants are 
uh, more convenient. Okay, so, so here's the utility of the cumulants. Like, how would you actually, like, if I gave you the cumulants for a random variable, how would you actually use them to compute expectations of things? Okay, well, it's, it's like pretty trivial, but I think it bears writing down. So, you know, the kind of thing I, I usually want to do is I want to compute the expectation of some function of my random variable, right? That's, that's the game we play. And okay, just by definition, this is f of z times, okay, I'm just going to pretend there's a density. It doesn't actually matter, z dz. Right, and now just by definition, this characteristic function here is the Fourier transform of the density. Okay, so, so you can just use that the inner product between f and the density is the same thing as the inner product between f hat, the Fourier transform of f evaluated at kind of your momentum variable c, and the characteristic function. So I'll just rewrite it here. Sum k greater or equal to zero, kappa k of z l i alpha, k factorial minus i c to the k. Okay, so, so all I'm saying, okay, dx c, can't forget the dx c, the all important dx c. Okay, so all I'm saying is that if I gave you all the cumulants of a random variable, you can calculate expectations of any observable you want in precisely this way. That's one way of thinking about them. Okay, so it's just an equivalent way of characterizing the distribution. Okay, so, so, so that's going to really be my goal. I'm going to study the cumulants of the output of a random neural network. That's how I'm going to be able to characterize its distribution. Okay, so, so are there questions about this? I just want to make sure the notation is not horribly mathematical for people. So, so, kappa, so my definition of kappa is it's the coefficients that appear in this exponent. So, so the left-hand side is perfectly well-defined. I'm not sure who asked the question, actually, now that I think about it. Oh, yeah, Abba. So, so saying, you know, this is just the characteristic function, but it depends on a parameter xi. And you could write it as a power series in xi, or you can write it as the exponential of a power series in xi. And I'm saying the coefficients you get here are going to be the cumulants. So, so, so for example, okay, when you work this out, kappa 0 is always equal to 1. Okay, kappa 1 just computes the expectation of your random variable. Okay, kappa 2 computes the variance of your random variable. Kappa 3 is called the excess kurtosis. Okay, whatever. Or the kurtosis, not the excess kurtosis. Okay, so, so what I'm saying is there's some reformulation of the moments, but they kind of normalize correctly. So if you've ever done diagrammatics, you know. Okay, or maybe you wish you never knew. It's one of the two. All right. Okay, so, 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 so in other words, this Gaussian process result that we get from Yasuman's lecture can just be reformulated like this. Okay, and then I'm going to state the theorem I want to actually prove. And then I'll start proving it and almost surely will not have time to finish. Okay, so, so, so let, let me call this, since it's still up here, let me just call this like set of convergence results to the GP pound. Okay, so just to be clear, so pound is the same as saying the following. Okay, so if I study, okay, so, so here, okay, I cheated a little. I defined the cumulant just for one random variable, but you can define connected correlations for any collection of random variables. So just allow me to write that. Z L plus one I one alpha one Z L plus one I K alpha K. This is something about the joint fluctuations of some collection of output neurons at some collection of inputs. And what we get in the infinite width limit converges as n goes to infinity. Okay, so you get zero if k is not equal to two. Right? The Gaussian is the unique thing where only its first and second cumulant can be non-zero. So here the mean is zero, so only the second cumulant survives. And when k equals 2, you get delta i1 i2 times k l plus 1 alpha 1 alpha 2 in this notation. Okay, that's like a, a way of rephrasing the convergence to a Gaussian process directly in terms of the cumulants. It's just completely equivalent. Okay, very good. So, 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 so and now you see why cumulants are so useful for studying things that are approximately Gaussian. It's much easier to do perturbation theory around zero, right? We're going to see in a moment that the, the cumulants beyond the second cumulant are actually going to be non-zero. They'll just go to zero at some rate. And we'll be able to actually explain at what rate they go to zero and compute recursions for them and get values. And OK, it's, it's going to happen, I promise. I'm just going slow. 
Okay, so, 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 um, okay, let me write one more thing and then I'll pause again. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to focus in the proof I'm going to do, though the, I'll state the theorem more generally, on, on the kind of the first non-Gaussian cumulant. I'll explain how to understand it. So I'm going to define kappa L4, like this is just going to be my notation. Okay, it's the one-third, you'll see why I want one-third in a second, it just simplifies things a little bit, oops, times the fourth cumulant of the distribution of ZLI alpha. Okay, so, so, so again, let me walk you through this. I fix a network input, just so that I don't have to have too many indices. I fix some neuron in layer L, and I compute its fourth cumulant. Then I divide by three. That's my definition of KL alpha. Okay, and if you want to write it out, you get the following. Okay, I'll write it in two lines. So, so just by definition, when you compute it, so, you know, I need to tell you what the fourth cumulant is, and when you work it out, you get this. You get one-third. This is the expectation of ZLI alpha to the fourth minus three times the expectation of ZLI alpha squared squared. Okay, so you just work out the combinatorics of this definition if you want. That's one way to do it. And you see, you, you already see this measures how non-Gaussian something is in some sense, right? If, it, if something is Gaussian, then the third moment, sorry, the fourth moment, at least if things are centered, is exactly three times the square of the second moment. Okay, so, so this is measuring how non-Gaussian your fluctuations are. But okay, I'll leave it as an exercise to the interested reader that in, in the case of these neural networks, there's yet another interpretation for this, which I like very much. It's also the covariance between ZL, let's say, 1 alpha squared and ZL, 2 alpha squared. Okay, so in other words, I'm saying the same quantity measures both how non-Gaussian my fluctuations are and how correlated neurons are. Okay, so, so, so understanding kappa L will help me to start understanding things about fluctuations and correlations. It's just the tip of the iceberg, so to speak, but at least it's one that I can do in a finite time on the board. Okay, so, so, so let me stop because I want to now formulate a theorem and then I'm going to start explaining what are the order parameters here, how can we study kappa L in terms of the order parameters, you know, like how do you organize all these calculations for trying to compute these kind of cumulants? Yeah, please. So, so because for a Gaussian, if Z were Gaussian, then Wick's theorem tells you, right, if you have a Gaussian, then the fourth moment is three times the second moment squared. So this would be zero for a Gaussian. And that's consistent with the fact that kappa four converges to zero in the infinite width limit. Okay, so, so I'm saying something is Gaussian if and only if, only its first two cumulants are non-zero. And so studying the fourth cumulant, okay, the third one is always zero, as I'll explain in a second, just by symmetry, things are even for me. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of the first piece of non-Gaussian fluctuations. That's how you can think about it, yeah. But, 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 okay, you'll see it's kind of the tip of the iceberg. Really, this kappa 4 is what controls all the 1 over n corrections to your random neural network. Okay, I'll, I'll explain that. But uh, there's a reason I'm focusing on it. Yeah, other questions? Okay, gonna, oh, yeah, please. Can you say why kappa 3 is 0? Yeah, so, so you see, in my definition, Okay, I erased my, weight, my weights, so I'll put them back here. W, L, I, J, Gaussian, mean zero, C, W over N, L, minus one. Um, the weights and biases are symmetric around zero. And so, so each of these neuron distributions is actually also symmetric around zero as a result. And so just by symmetry, all the odd cumulants are zero. Like even at finite width, even everything. It's just you condition on the previous layer, and then it's exactly a Gaussian. And like, you know, it's, it's a Gaussian with mean zero. And so every odd moment will vanish. And odd cumulants depend only on odd moments. So the nonlinearity doesn't that? No, the nonlinearity doesn't because, because you see, you, you look at this definition here. So imagine conditioning first on what happens at layer L. And then here I get just the bare Bs and Ws. So you, I use just the symmetry in one layer to do it, right? Um, yeah, other questions? Okay, very good. Let me erase. Where am I? Oh my god. Okay. Very good. Oh man. Okay. Let me 
they're doing. Very nice. All right, so, so let me state now a theorem. OK, so, so I don't really know how to attribute the theorem. OK, in the, in the truly mathematical sense, the theorem is in a paper I just wrote. But, but really, part of what I'll present was in this kind of, at least at a physics level of rigor, this beautiful paper of Shoyaida, which I sort of viewed as a breakthrough. It, it got the first way to do these 1 over n corrections that I knew of in general. And then there's this book that I mentioned that I wrote with Dan Roberts and Shoyaida. OK, so fine. Um, OK, so, so, so here, here's the, okay, the statement is going to be like this. So first of all, I want to know how close am I to being a Gaussian? That's the first thing I'm going to state a theorem about. And I'm going to measure it by the size of the cumulants. So, so if you study the cumulant, and here you can sort of be ridiculously general. So you can study derivatives. So capital Ds just mean derivatives of Z, L, I1, alpha 1. So these are derivatives with respect to the input. That's the way you do it. D, L, K. Oh my god. There's just a, too many indices, but I can't help but state the most general result. That's the mathematician in me coming out. OK, so, so what do you get? So you get the following estimates. OK, so first of all, there's 0 when k is odd. And like I said, this is just a symmetry thing. That's not a, a deep statement. But the point is to get first an order of magnitude estimate on these cumulants as a function of n. So there's a big O, and it depends on the depth and the nonlinearity and everything else for now. And you get n to the minus k over 2 plus 1 okay, when k is even. So, so you might recognize this. This is sometimes called hierarchical clustering. Okay, that's the kind of thing that happens when things are self, like averages of n independent random variables. Um, okay, so, so, so what I'm saying is that if you don't care about the dependence on l, indeed, so when k equals 2, the exponent here is 0, and that's corresponds to the fact that the Gaussian is non-degenerate infinite width. And when k is bigger than or equal to 4, you know, you get higher and higher powers of 1 over n. So things are higher and higher order suppressed, higher and higher you go in the cumulants. That's, that's the first part of the statement. But OK, there, there's much more. OK, so moreover, yeah. Yeah, so, so here you take an input x alpha. This is a multi-index j. And you take you know, any number of derivatives you want in any like, components of the x's. So this is like maybe d by dx1 times d by dx2 squared times d by dx3. So this is like the derivative of, like, you know, that's a perfectly well-defined thing. And then I can choose which neuron I want and which input to evaluate it. Oh, sorry. I should say kappa k. Okay. But, but OK, generally, when you write out all the random variables, you know that it's just the, the connected correlation function of these k things. That's why you know it's k. And here, I kind of abbreviated when I introduced the cumulants, because I didn't want to write z k times. Is that OK? Uh, yeah. OK, wonderful. All right, so, so, so good. So, so what do we get? So, so we also get recursions of the following form. So uh, Yasuman yesterday was mentioning hierarchies of recursions. And remember that in the infinite width limit, right? do I still have it up here? Yes, I do. We had a recursion for kl plus 1 in terms of kl. And what I'm trying to say is that that's just the top level of an infinite hierarchy of recursions, which give you recursions for these cumulants. OK, so you can write at layer l plus 1 a 2 k cumulant. OK, I'm just suppressing the inputs here as a certain explicit function. And in fact, I'll give you an example of this recursion, and we'll prove it probably in the next lecture already, but we'll, we'll get there. OK, some function of cumulants in the previous layer with the j less than or equal to k. OK, so, so once you solve the recursion for the two-point function, you can then get a recursion for the four-point function. And then once you solve the recursion for the four-point function, you can get a recursion for the six-point function. OK, that's how integrable hierarchies usually work, or not necessarily integrable, but you know, solvable hierarchies. OK, so you get recursions. OK, but like the infomercials say, but wait, there's more. OK, as well as okay, it's a long theorem. I apologize. But I wanted to at least put all the things up here. 
Ah, oh, okay, I'm gonna erase this. It's sad, but it's gonna have to happen. Okay, so 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 not only do you get these kind of recursions, but you can you know satisfy what at least is my dream. I wanted to learn how to compute expectations. Okay, so so you get expansions like this. So if I wanted to know what's the expectation of some function f applied to some collection of neurons, let's say I have. Um, okay, I'm going to restrict to one input because otherwise there are too many indices to reproduce cleanly. But I'm going to study the joint distribution of let's say m neurons in layer L. Okay, so, so, so what do you get? Well, okay, you get that first you get the infinite width answer. That's the leading order term. Okay, so when I write these kind of brackets, brackets for me mean Gaussian integral. Okay, that's the thing you would have gotten if you had just sent n to infinity. But you get plus, so and this is why kappa 4 is so important. You get kappa L4 over 8, believe it or not. Okay, and then you get a Gaussian integral and you get the sum. J goes from 1 up to M. You get a kind of local operator that you insert, which just takes some derivatives of F. ZM. Okay, KL. Okay, plus higher order corrections. So we'll, you can get all the higher order corrections too, but let me just focus on this. You see, the first part of the theorem tells you that kappa 4 comes in at order 1 over n. And so, so what I'm saying is that this additional piece here is the 1 over n correction that you get when you're at finite width. And you can just compute it as a Gaussian integral with respect to the infinite width Gaussian, but you have to deform your observable f. That's the usual thing that happens. And I'll explain how to do this. I think it's kind of a nice technique to see. Okay, so, so and then finally, and this is the thing I'll actually show you, just so that you don't think I'm totally lying, okay? I hate when people black box functions. Okay, it makes me anxious because then I worry that I can't do it myself. So like, here's my favorite recursion. Okay, and you might be concerned, how can you remember all these things? But okay, I wrote it down at least 17 million times. Okay, so, so I'm going to relate the fourth cumulant at layer L plus 1 to the fourth cumulant at layer L. Okay, so, so the first term has order 1 over n, and it's your variance for the weights squared times the variance with respect to the infinite width Gaussian of just your nonlinearity squared. Okay, it's a one-dimensional Gaussian integral. Plus, you get CW over 2. Time you, you take the second derivative of your nonlinearity squared, Gaussian integral, squared times kappa L4, okay, plus there are corrections of lower order in N. And so, so you see it's not so horrifying, although you might think it's horrifying, right? If you know the dynamics for KL, if you know how the kernel behaves at infinite width, then these are just coefficients that you know in this recursion, and you can understand what happens to the cumulant, right? So, so if you don't look too closely, this thing roughly, okay, this is just kind of a remark, looks like A divided by NL plus B times kappa L4, if I just call these coefficients things. Okay, and, and then what happens when you set CW correctly, this coefficient B is basically equal to 1. That's this thing that Nahi was asking me about before. So in ReLU, we'll check this later. What, if CW is 2, this whole coefficient is 1. Okay, so that's what the recursion looks like. And what you see is what I was advertising before. So kappa L plus 1, 4, you know, you get A divided by the sum of these 1 over N Ls. So I'll call this A sub sigma, let's say. It depends on your nonlinearity. Is A sub sigma times 1 over N1 plus 1 over N L. And so, so, so the reason I wanted to, to say this is that, you see, the first part of the theorem makes you pessimistic about the whole project, potentially, because the fourth cumulant, for example, has order 1 over n. So who cares? It's like a little correction. But what I'm saying is, if you think back to those pictures I was drawing with the rays, although it's suppressed to 1 order and 1 over n, it's actually promoted to 1 over an l, to 1 order an l. So, so it actually becomes more and more important as l grows. And it's one of the effects that you cannot see of depth unless you go to finite width. Okay, so, so, so that's kind of why it's cool to have a recursion like this. Okay, so, so, so let me stop. My, my plan is to explain how you derive these kind of things. And I'm going to go slow, and hopefully the technique will be interesting and useful to people. But I want to pause for questions or comments about the statement. Okay, 
Uh, yeah, it's fair enough. I re-indexed, you're right, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So, sorry, so, so this is just my abbreviation for, you see, this is a function of x alpha 1. And so I can take some derivatives in, in x alpha 1. Like I take the seventh partial derivative with respect to the fourth component. So this d just means you can take arbitrary derivatives. So, so j is just a multi-index that tells you, you know, what derivatives you're taking. It's just, it's, it's, I'm not going to go back to this notation too much, but I care about derivatives because, you know, derivatives with respect to parameters can also eventually be rewritten as derivatives with respect to inputs. So really here I wrote it with respect to inputs, but you can start studying gradients both with respect to x and with respect to theta for these things. Yeah. So sigma is the nonlinearity. Yeah, I'm, I'm just saying like you, you see that sigma appears here and sigma dictates what CW to choose. So, so things depend on, yeah. Yeah. Uh, what do you mean by average kappa one kappa L at the top left? Oh, so, sorry, what do I mean by this? So that first equality, right? Yeah. Just below the expectation. Oh, oh what, sorry, what do I mean by this? Yeah. Sorry, I said it too quickly. So, so this is, Capital K, so I apologize for having lowercase kappas and capital Ks. And capital K is just the covariance kernel of your Gaussian process at infinite width. So, so these brackets, for me, mean Gaussian expectation at infinite width. So, so it's like you should think these brackets are things you can readily compute. No one can stop you from computing things that are Gaussian integrals. Okay, people say Gaussian integrals are hard, but I don't believe them. You know, that's basically my point of view. No, that's not true, but, but yeah. Yeah. Uh, could it be that L enters in some weird ways uh, in that correction, like as a squared and so corrections are important? And so, so and yeah, okay, so phenomenal. I was hoping somebody would ask. Okay, I was waiting. I was going to pounce later, but yes. So, indeed, so, so these big O terms, they're annoying. They depend on L. And indeed, the correct answer is that this is O of L over N squared. That's actually the truth. And I'll show you how to do it for ReLU networks to see the full L over N. OK, so, so I like these techniques because they work for any sigma, any number of inputs, whatever. But they have a big downside from some mathematical point of view, which is you know, if you want to understand what happens as a function of L over N, you have to do resummation. Right? Things that are high order suppressed in N might be promoted to higher order in L. In fact, they are. And so, so you know, in the linear network, I sort of like did some magical trick to get L over N to come out. And you can do that for ReLU as well, but I don't know how to do it for general nonlinearity. So this is kind of the best I know. Yep. In yesterday's resonance, like it was striking a similar uh, term, or, or like that, huh? like the expectation of O of S and S terms, and then there was some arbitrary S, and the even part was basically the same, right? And yeah, right. They're quite related. So, so, so they are. So, so the truth is that, OK, thank you. I actually meant to say something about that. So Yasman presented this beautiful kind of conjecture of Dyer and Garari about the order of magnitude of correlation functions at initialization that they use to actually do these 1 over n asymptotics for training. And I'm sure that these techniques will allow you to prove that in general. Um, but, but, but in the paper, I don't. Because you see, I'm not, like, they need to sum over parameters. And I'm not doing these sums over parameters. That's the extra difficulty. And that's like even more indices. And I gave up at some point, and I just wrote this. Yeah. Yeah. OK, wonderful. OK, so, 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 so good. Good. I have the theorem statement. I have 15 minutes. OK, I can at least start the proof. And then I'll try to finish it in the afternoon. Or if people cry bloody murder and don't want to see it, I will go on to doing path counting for ReLU networks. All right. So, so, so I'm going to explain how to derive this recursion. And I'm going to explain how to derive this recursion. And then I'm going to punt on this because this is very painful, at least in the way I know how to do it. So, so here's my proof. OK, really, it's a sketch for the case of like kappa L4, basically. OK, so, so, so what the heck am I trying to do, right? Um, well, well what, what did Remy Monason teach us, what seems like an infinite amount of time ago, 
OK, or at least taught me. I didn't really know these words before. If you're going to do anything, you need to find order parameters. Okay, and then once you find order parameters, it's just enough cups of coffee that will let you solve the problem. OK, so, so, so indeed, so step one is you have to figure out what the order parameters in this model are. OK, so I'm going to tell you what they are. Um, OK, so, so I mean, you know, whenever you have a large parameter n, the kind of order parameters you can hope for are averages of things like 1 over n times the sum of some n terms. And indeed, it turns out the relevant order parameters we have have the following form. So this is my definition of this order parameter. O stands for observable, if you want. OK, this is just the average over all the neurons in layer L of the same function f applied to the preactivations of that neuron. OK, so, so, so I'm going to explain why these are order parameters for me. Um, but at least intuitively, it's kind of clear, right? If you believe that as NL goes to infinity, these preactivations become more and more independent, right? Then this is just an average of essentially independent random variables, and it's going to self-average in the infinite width limit. And that's the kind of thing we're going to use. OK, so very good. Step one turned out to be easy. OK, so, so step two. Let me explain how to rewrite everything we care about, namely the characteristic function, which I don't know if I have anymore, uh, of zli alpha and this kappa l4 in terms of these order parameters. Okay, so rewrite this characteristic function, the expectation x minus i c zli alpha, okay, and kappa l4 via the order parameters. So let me explain how to do that. It's not too bad. And then probably in the afternoon, again, assuming people want to see the details, I'll then explain how to actually use this rewriting to get the recursions that I wrote. OK, so, so, so you know, all we're saying basically is that the structure of a fully connected neural network is that it's symmetric in every layer, right? There's no ordering of neurons in the layer. So it makes sense that things will be only in terms of averages. OK, so, so let's see that. So, so what's the key point? So the key point for doing this is just not to freak out too much. That's what I always tell myself when I try to do a calculation. It's easier than I think it is unless I start expanding everything. OK, so, so if you just think about what happens at layer L plus 1 for some neuron, Right? You can think of it as a dot product, oops, this is BL plus 1 I, between a vector of Gaussians, L plus 1 I1, and W L plus 1 I N L, with the vector 1 and then sigma of Z L 1 alpha down to sigma of Z L and L alpha. Oops. OK, so I apologize for telling you things you already know. But, but, but if you just stare at this for a second, what you realize is that you know, what makes a neural network hard to study is that you have many layers. But conditional on one layer, the next layer is very simple. It's just a Gaussian. There's nothing to it. Right? So what do we find? So thus, given ZL alpha, if I think of this previous layer for a moment as being frozen, the distribution of the ZIs is very simple. Right? The ZL plus 1 I alphas. Right, so, so there's a basic fact. If you take a Gaussian and you take its dot product with any collection of vectors, everything remains Gaussian. Okay, so, so this means that this is Gaussian. Okay, the mean is zero because the mean is just the sum of these means times these constants, but all of my weights and biases had mean zero. And the variance is just the sum of the variances. Right, the variance of the bias times one is just CB. And then I get the sum over the other ones. Okay, I get CW over NL. That's the variance of each weight, but the variance is quadratic in the constants. So you get the sum on j goes from 1 up to nl, sigma of z l j alpha squared. OK, so, so these are Gaussian, and they're independent for all the various i's. i goes from 1 up to nl plus 1. Right? Conditional in the previous layer, they're independent Gaussians. And what do you see? Okay, if you squint and don't expand too much, that's where that advice comes in. Right, this is nothing more than an order parameter. I'll call it sigma L 
alpha, right, is just an average over the previous layer of the same function applied to every neuron in the layer. And so, so, so there I go. I've rewritten the distribution, the conditional distribution of ZL plus 1 given the previous layer in terms of my order parameter. And this is enough to rewrite everything else I care about in terms of the order parameter as well. OK, so let me do that carefully. And that will probably be the end of what I say for now. Oh my god. OK. So OK, now comes the like computational part. So let's start with this thing. So I'm going to actually do something very slightly more general, because I'll need it. OK, so we have. All right, I, I want to write the characteristic function not just of one z, but of, of m z's. You see, because I want to understand the distribution of not just one neuron, but m neurons. So but nothing can really stop me, okay, unless I get tired and need lunch, or I'm desperate to listen to Julia's lecture, which I am. OK, so what do you get? You get x of minus i, and you get the sum on k goes from 1 up to m, and you get a dual variable for each z. ZL plus 1 K alpha. OK, that's the characteristic function of this random vector of Zs. Um, and what do you do? You say, well, look, instead of trying to integrate out all the weights and biases, that's what this expectation is, let me just integrate out the ones in the final layer. OK, so, so I'll be very careful. I don't know if people like the probabilist notation, but that's how I was taught to do it. OK, so you have the same thing. K goes from 1 up to M. Psi k times zl plus 1 k alpha. But now in this inner expectation, I condition on zl. And in the outer expectation, I integrate over zl. That's an allowable move. Right? Like, I, I, can, I can first freeze everything up to the previous layer. In this inner integral, I integrate out the weights and biases in the final layer. And then I integrate out everything else. OK, but the point is that conditional on ZL, each one of these things is just an independent Gaussian. Right? So what do you get? You get that this is the expectation. And you get the product on k goes from 1 up to m. The sum in the exponent becomes a product because they're conditionally independent of just the characteristic function of a Gaussian. Right? x minus i ck ZL plus 1 k alpha given ZL. OK, not too bad. Oh my god, wrong bracket. All right, very nice. Right, and now we know the characteristic function of a Gaussian. OK, and if we don't, we don't tell anyone, and we look it up, and we pretend we knew all along. At least that's my strategy. Right, so this is just the expectation of the product on k goes from 1 up to m of x. Right, the Gaussian Hamiltonian is just quadratic. It only has first and second cumulants, minus 1 half. And you get ck squared times the variance, sigma L alpha. OK, so I'm almost done. Let me just take the product back inside the exp. So this is the expectation of the exp of minus 1 half. And I just get the norm of the vector c squared times the variance, sigma L alpha. OK, so, that, so that's very nice. I just took the characteristic function of things at layer L plus 1. And I rewrote it in terms only of one of my order parameters at layer L. So that sounds like I made at least epsilon of progress. And I'm going to use that progress in a moment. OK, are there questions about this? Can you from 1 to n plus 1? No, well, so, 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 OK. Yes, you could take m to, uh, to be arbitrary, but I don't want it to scale with n. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm talking about like the distribution of finitely many neurons. And I just call that number m. Yeah, if m were to scale with n, there would be problems for me. Yeah. Okay, very nice. So, so, so I just took the first quantity that I wanted to understand, which is the characteristic function, okay, at layer l plus 1. Now let me do kappa l4, and that will be it. So, so all right, let me, okay, not squeeze it in. I don't know why I like to, you know, squeeze in these calculations. All right, very good. OK, so next, OK, let's do it. We can do it. We can do Gaussian integration. Oops, no one can stop us. OK, so 
by definition, right, this was one third the expectation of ZL plus one I alpha to the fourth minus the expectation of Z L plus one I alpha squared squared. Okay, very strong. So many calculations, okay. So now I'm gonna do the same thing, right? The distribution of this random variable is complicated, but if I first condition on the previous layer, it's trivial, it's just a Gaussian. Okay, so in each of these expectations, I can condition on the previous layer. Good. Expectation. So I'm sorry to write so carefully, but I can't follow people's calculations unless they write this carefully usually. So I try to write carefully. Okay, like this. So this is a big thing. Minus the expectation of the expectation. Oh my god. Okay. Z L plus one. I alpha squared given Z L. Bam, bam, squared. Okay, so, so now, once you've conditioned on ZL in this inner integral, this thing is just a Gaussian with mean zero and variance sigma L. And we already said that the, that the fourth moment of a Gaussian is three times its variance squared. Uh, shoot, there was a three here. I messed up the definition, excuse me. Okay, and in the second one, in this inner integral, it's just the variance of the Gaussian. So I get minus three times the expectation of sigma L alpha squared. Okay, the threes cancel, and what do I get? I get a very nice expression. It's just the variance of the Z L alpha. Right, the expectation of the square minus the square of the expectation. So, so what do you find? You find that the fourth cumulant at layer L plus one is just the variance of one of these order parameters at the previous layer. And, okay, that makes sense, right? If this is an order parameter and there's any justice in the world, it's self-averaging, so its variance goes to zero at infinite width. Okay, so, 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 so there you have it. We're gonna check that the variance of this thing goes to zero at infinite width, and we're gonna use that to conclude the order of magnitude for kappa L, and then we'll, we'll use the characteristic function that we got right here to actually compute expectations of observables. Okay, so, so, so I better not try to squeeze it in, so let me just stop and ask for questions or comments. And then I encourage you to tell me, either directly or passive-aggressively, after the lecture, whether you want to see the rest of the proof. In some sense, this rewriting is like the key step, but there's a couple more steps to actually do the manipulations. Okay, so are there any questions or comments? Is So, so that's right, so, so, so that's one way to check it. You do this explicit calculation, you get this, starting from this definition, and you start from the covariance of the squares, and you get this, and you see that this one-third here was kind of crucial in a way, because you know, like at a, like when all the indices are the same here, you get an extra three from the Gaussian kind of structure. Yeah. Okay, so, so, so let me stop, um, and I'm happy to discuss this more offline.